So, in this lecture, we shall be looking at some of the examples where we will be using both blocking and the non blocking styles, and we shall see some of the features and some of the issues that might that might happen or that might arise. So, this is our part 2 of this lecture fine. So, as I said, so we shall be looking at some actually small examples. Now, why we are good doing that? Means our objective is to try to give you a feel that for what kind of design, which kind of assignment statement should be better suited and there are a few practices which might lead to some errors which are best avoided. These are or this may be regarded as not so good design practices. So, while we discuss the various styles and we look at the different examples, we shall see that some of the design styles may lead to some constructs which are very easily uh, confused by the designer that the designer may very easily insert some error means inadvertently in the design it is very easy to do so if you are not extremely careful. So, there are some constructs which are best avoided like one I already told you in the last lecture that you should avoid using both blocking and non blocking assignment within the same always or the same initial block. Okay. So, the first example we take is that of a multiplexer this is a 8 line to 1 line multiplexer, this is the behavioral description of it. Now, just to tell you an 8 line to 1 line multiplexer, what is this schematic we are looking at? So, we are looking at a 8 to 1 multiplexer whose output is out, there are 3 select lines which we call as SCL and there are 8 input lines. Okay. The input lines are called in. So, depending on the select line one of the input will be selected. Now, earlier we had seen that we can very easily model a multiplexer using an assign statement like we can write assign out equal to in cell. So, if we use a vector on the right hand side with a variable as the index, this will generate a multiplexer, this is what we mentioned. But here we are going a little bit into the behavior of it, but instead of using assign statement, we are trying to use a procedural block to model a multiplexer. So, how we do it? We are using a we are using an always block. So, let us see here the parameters are in cell and out, in is the input there are 8 lines, select line there are 3 bits and output. See this output we are declaring as reg because inside this always block we are assigning some value to this out. So, I mentioned inside the procedural block the left hand side has to be either reg or an integer or a real or a time variable. Okay. So, here we have defined it as type reg. Okay. Now, here we are saying that always at the rate star whenever some in values change input values change either in or cell you do this. It is a simple case statement on cell. Here we are just enumerating all 8 binary combinations 0 0 0 up to 1 1 1. If it is 0 0 0, then in 0 is selected it will be assigned to out. If 0 0 1, then in 1 will be assigned to out and so on. If it is 1 1 1, in 7 will be assigned to out. Now, you see at the end we have given a default case which says that we are initializing some undefined value to out. Now, you may ask that well we have already defined all possible 8 combinations here in the case. So, why do you need to 
specify default. Oh, okay. So, you remember that in Verilog we mentioned when we talked about variables and their values that Verilog is actually a four valued logic modeling system. So, every variable can assume a value not only 0 and 1, but also x and z. Due to some problem in the test bench or the circuit which is driving, maybe you have not initialized some variable in a proper way. The select line may be coming here as an x value. So, what will happen? So, it will not match with any one of 0000001 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1 up to 111. So, it is a different value x. So, for those cases it will go to the default default option. So, it will get matched to the default and the output will also be set to undefined x in that case. right? So, this is a multiplexer. The next example we take is a synchronous up down counter. Now, let us again look at what kind of uh, circuit we are talking about. Here we are talking about a circuit which is a up down counter which can count up or which can also count down. Here the count value which is the output this we are calling as count. Now, we can initialize the value of the counter there is another input called d in. There is an input called clear, I can clear the counter to 0. I can load the counter with this input value d in if I want and of course, there is a clock. These are my signal values in this counter. So, I can clear it to all zeros, so I can load it with any value I want and if I apply a clock it will count and there of course, there is another input called mode. Mode will tell whether I am going to count up or count down. If mode equal to 0, it means I want to count down. If mode equal to 1, it means I want to count up. Right? This is the circuit which we want to design or model in Verilog. Let us see how we have done it. So, the first thing we have done it is that we have defined all the parameters mode, clear, load, data in, clock and count. These four are the input signals, d in also input, but d in is a vector 8 bit counter I am assuming 8 bits and count is also an output which also is a reg because we are assigning count we have defined as reg also 8 bits. And here we are doing everything in a synchronous way load, clear everything is synchronous this will happen at the positive edge of the clock. So, whenever there is a positive edge of the clock, we first check whether the load input is 1 or not. If the load input is 1, then the value is loaded from D in. Next we check if clear is 1, if clear is 1 then count value is initialized to 0 or else we check if mode is 1 or 0. If mode is 1, we increment the count by 1 up count, if mode is 0 we decrement it by 1 down count. So, so, this shows you the behavior of the up down counter. So, you see using this kind of non blocking statement we can model this counter in a very convenient way. Well, of course, here the statements are not executing concurrently because of the if then else exactly one of them will be executing. Okay. But there could have been more statements also. Next, let us look at a parameterized design. Parameterized design we mentioned earlier, we can define some kind of a constant called a parameter. Like here we define, say here we are trying to design an n bit counter, but n can be anything. We are specifying the value of n by this parameter, parameter n equal to 7. But inside my program, I am using n everywhere. Well, here just in one place. So, the count register I am declaring of size n. So, 
So, if n equal to 7 means I am actually declaring an 8 bit register okay, 1 more than this 0 to 7. Okay, so, n will be 1 less than that. Okay. So, actually it will be n plus 1 not exactly n 1 more than that. So, the declaration is very simple. So, always just assuming that the counter will be count at the negative edge of the clock at the negative edge of the clock there is a clear if clear you clear the count or otherwise you increase the count by 1. Right? So, using this parameter you can create a general design where you can only change this one single line and your entire design can become a instead of an 8 bit counter it can become a 16 bit counter. Right? This example shows that you can have a module where you can use more than one clocks. There can be very complex designs I means in such complex designs you may be using not only one clock, but more than one clock. So, one clock signal may be used to control one part of the circuit, the other clock signal may be used to control some other part of the circuit and those two parts may be executing concurrently under the control of the two clocks. The two clocks may be of different frequencies also. right? So, in Verilog even inside a single module you can do this kind of modeling very easily. Here I am assuming that the two clocks are there clock 1 and clock 2 and A B C these are inputs and F 1 and F 2 are two outputs declared as reg. So, I can use and this is just a very simple example for illustration. I can use two concurrent always block let us say one of them is triggering at the positive edge of clock 1 other one is triggering at the negative edge of clock 2. So, these are working concurrently one of them is assigning the value A and B to F 1 and and the other one is a, it is assigning B XOR C the exclusive OR to F 2 and they are happening concurrently in synchronism with two different clocks. The clocks may be of different phases different frequencies. Okay. So, there is no restriction there. So, you can have a very general design like this where multiple signals can be used to synchronize the operation of your design this is possible. Not only that you can also use the two edges of the same clock multiple edges of the same clock you can use to carry out some operations. Like in this example I am using a single clock signal CLK A B are the inputs this output range this F is an output and T is another temporary I am assuming. Just see what you are doing here. Here let us say I have a clock signal the clock signal is coming like this let us say these are the positive edges and the negative edges I am showing by a different color these are the negative edges. Now, let us look at the specification the specification says that always at the positive edge of the clock you do F assign T and B. So, at the positive edge let us say here you are doing F assign T and B this statement is executing and at the negative edge you are doing T assigned A or B. Let us say here at the negative edge you are doing T assigned A or B. So, you see what is happening here in this in this F statement F assigned T and B you are using the value of T and T is getting assigned by this statement which is happening at this clock. So, you can say that I am doing some computation which is starting here and it is continuing till here. I am using two edges. So, at the first edge I am computing a value T and at the second edge I am using that value T to compute some other final value F and this will go on repeating. Right? So, 
this is one way or one technique using which we can actually carry out two operations within a single clock period. We can do something in the rising edge of the clock, something else in the falling edge of the clock and one of the values may be fed to the input of the other computation like in the example I showed just now. right? So, this is quite possible. So, let us take another example. This is a uh, this, this is an example which shows some addition and subtraction operations similar with this multiple edge clock that same kind of a thing. Here we are using let us say this a plus b a minus b uh, here of course, the input description is not complete let us make it complete let us say input a b clock let us make another declaration let us say we define input let us say we have 8 bits and we define a, b, c and d all of them. Let us declare like this, this a, b, c, d all are 8 bit inputs let us say and this f is a edge, t is also a edge, t is not required here of course, c uh, let us make it t, no fine it is fine. No, this t is not required. So, t you can forget fine. So, here you see at the positive edge you are doing a plus b is assigning to c. So, whatever value was there in c that gets modified and at the negative edge of the clock you are using that value of c subtracting with d and you are storing it into another value f right. So, in this okay, this f will also be a vector sorry this will also be a vector like this fine. So, here at the rising edge you are doing some computation at the falling edge you are doing some computation. So, you can do two computation in the same clock cycle one addition and one subtraction if your clock cycle time is large enough. So, basically what I am saying is that you are carrying out two operations in every clock cycle in these always loops. In the first positive edge of the clock c is assigned a value the sum of a and b and at the other one at the falling edge of the clock f is assigned a value this is the subtraction of c and d. So, here we assume that our clock cycle time is large enough so that this addition and subtraction can be completed within half a clock cycle. For this kind of a scenario we can use these multiple edges of the same clock to activate two operations. Okay. All right. So, let us now look at the example of a ring counter. Okay. Now, I mean what is a ring counter? Just recall ring counter is nothing but a shift register. So, I am showing a 4 bit ring counter it is just a shift register comprising of several d flip flops so the output of one flip flop is connected to the input of the other ring counter means they are connected as a ring as a chain and this counter is initialized typically to the state 1 0 0 0 and the clock signal is applied to all the flip flops together this is the clock. So, if you initialize this shift register with 1 0 0 0 and if you go on applying the clock. So, what will happen initially it was 1 0 0 0 after 1 clock it will be rotating right by one place. So, this 1 will be shifted here. So, this 0 will come back, 0 will come here. Next clock, this 1 will come here, this 0 will again come back, 0, 0, 1, 0. Next clock, 0, 0, 0, 1, then again it will go back to 1, 0, 0, 0. So, this will repeat, right. This is the function of the ring counter. So, here in this design, he actually we are showing you an 8 bit ring counter. 
So, we have a clock, um, we have a init, init signal which will be initializing the ring counter to a single 1 and the all zeros and the output of the counter which is count. So, clock and init are the inputs and count is the output which is the edge. So, so, every time when there is a clock edge, pause edge, we are checking that if init is active, init is 1, well if init is 1, we are initializing count to this 1 0 0 0 0. So, you see here we are using blocking assignment statement, else begin count equal to count shift left by 1, then count 0 equal to count 7. Now, tell me whether this is a correct description of a ring counter. So, these two statements do they actually do the shifting correctly? Just see count is an 8 bit variable right. So, let me just show you count is an 8 bit register there are 8 flip flops. So, I have 1 here and there are 7 zeros. this is my count. Now, in this code what we are doing in this begin end we are first shifting count left by 1. So, if you shift it left by 1 this 1 will go out and 1 will disappear and shift left by default will feed a 0 on the right. So, the counter will become all 0. So, after the shift left this 1 will disappear and then you are saying count 0 equal to count 7 to make the rotator, but this count 7 has already become 0. So, even if you store this 0 here this value will still remain 0, this 1 will not come back. Okay. So, means after a rotate operation after this begin and block the count value will become all 0 and after that it will remain all 0. Okay. So, this is not a correct description of a ring counter. So, as I said this solution is wrong, this count 7 will get overwritten in the first statement itself it will become 0 and the rotation will not happen. So, how I can rectify this error? It is very easy, I change the blocking to non blocking. See here what will happen, here we are doing the same thing, but we are using a non blocking assignment, let us see what will happen. So, now our statements are the first statement says count non blocking, count shift left by 1 and the second statement says count 0 assign count 7. Now, again let us look at the count, this is an 8 bit register what will happen let us see. Suppose initially my register contains this, this is my count and these are the index values 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 and 7. Now, according to the rule of the non blocking assignments the right hand sides will be evaluated first concurrently. So, if you do a count less than less than 1 what will happen? If you do a count less than less than 1 this was the count, so it will become all 0, but count 0 this count 7 count 7 is 1 now you are assigning them together. So, when you are just assigning them this count 7 1 this is also with getting stored this will be assigned to count 0. So, this 0 will become 1 and the remaining bits will become 0. This is how it is interpreted. So, actually the rotation will take place correctly here. Okay. Fine. So, here this is the correct version rotation will actually take place. 
Now, in fact, even without using this uh, non blocking we can have a correct version like this. Suppose, I write my blocking assignment like this, I write count equal to count 6 to 0 and count 7 concatenated. What does this mean? Count 6 to 0 means you see this part count 6 to 0 bit number 6 to bit number 0. You take this first these are all zeros, 6 zeros concatenate with count 7, count 7 is this it is 1, you concatenate this with 1, take this whole thing together. So, 1 has already come here, you assign this to count 0 0 0 0 0 0 1, which is what it should be rotate right, rotate left in fact, okay, fine. So, this will also work correctly. So, you see that using either blocking or non blocking assignment, if you know what it means, what the statements do and how they execute, you will be able to find out that whether or not your model is correct or not. Because you may see that you have written something, but while simulation you see that your result or the output is not coming correctly. So, you will have to interpret why it is so that what is the problem or what is the error in your code. You will have to understand what is the meaning of the blocking assignment, how they execute, how they change the values then only you will be able to debug and come up with a correct version of the code. So, with this we come to the end of this lecture. Now, in the next lecture we shall be continuing with some other aspects of blocking and non blocking assignments till then you can refresh your memory. I mean that means, I strongly suggest whatever I am covering I am discussing you try to work them up yourself, you try to run them at least on the simulation platform and get a feel of if you make some changes what is the impact that you get on the output. Okay. Only then you will be able to learn the language and and will be able to get a confidence on the language constructs that are available. Okay. Thank you.